Okay, so today uh, we are looking at chapter six in the YFS manual, the, the Youth Fitness Specialist Manual, um, which is going to be cardiorespiratory training. Uh, so we're going to talk about like basically how to apply the appropriate level of stress on the cardiovascular system to develop it in specific ways, right? So um, we're definitely going to use our information from the OPT model here. Uh, you know, we're going to use it to, to kind of build um, these specific routines, the OPT model, you know, the benefits there are that it's very progressive, right? Like you start at the bottom and you work your way up to the top. We want to have the same approach when it comes to our uh, cardiovascular training. So, you know, we know that uh, obviously childhood obesity is a big deal. And so like getting youths engaged in like cardiorespiratory exercise is a great way to, you know, reduce their risk for, for certain chronic diseases. Um, it's fun. It's engaging, uh, you know, uh, or at least it should be right. <laughs> if we're, if we're designing it appropriately. Um, and so that's going to have really positive effects and stuff. So our ideas today, like what we want to get through and understand like why cardiorespiratory training is so important, uh, understand like our general cardiorespiratory guidelines and then how to, you know, create these fun, uh, cardio programs, right? So we know that uh, childhood obesity, like I said, is is reaching sort of epidemic levels where, you know, it's it's um, and we're not talking about like when we say like childhood obesity, we do mean obesity, right? Like we mean that uh, youths that are in the 95th or higher like percentile body mass index wise, right? Rather than uh, looking at it. Um, you know, just as like overweight, which, you know, is a problem in and of itself, but like, that's something that pretty much, you know, fluctuates, right? Um, and so this can increase our risk for chronic diseases and conditions, um, you know, that, that go into adulthood. And so cardiorespiratory training sort of combats a lot of those things because, you know, number one, it's very good for the body, right? It's putting stress on the body to like develop the cardiorespiratory system. But also number two, it just burns a lot of calories, which has, you know, uh, positive metabolic effects as well. And so it can decrease our risk of obesity. It can decrease our risk of uh, diseases in positive, have positive influences uh, by improving mood, right? Like you increase, you create a lot of like hormones and endorphins while you're doing cardio. Um, it can improve your self-esteem because you're going to be able to, you, you know, our youths are going to be more, they're going to have higher levels of self-efficacy. They're going to have higher levels of self-esteem, better, po more positive body image. Um, and it just improves their overall health. I mean, it has like a, a pretty positive aspect on pretty much everything uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, a youth's overall sort of like athletic composure, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, looking at the cardiorespiratory system, just by definition here, because uh, I always like to have kind of a definition at the top, right? It's going to be comprised of your cardiovascular system, that's your heart, blood, and blood vessels, and your respiratory system, which is your respiratory pump and all of your respiratory passageways. So when you think about like, you know, the, the cardiovascular side of things, right? That's your heart, which is definitely going to get strengthened by performing cardio exercise, right? It's just going to make your heart have to squeeze harder and it's going to have to squeeze, uh, as you know, a certain amount of like frequency, right? And so like when you put it in that elevated state, it develops, it gets better at contracting harder and it gets better at contracting quickly if it needs to, right? Um, you are developing it just like you would develop any other muscle that you happen to be training. Um, your blood, because of like specific enzymes that are, uh, that are occurring um, during like aerobic metabolism, particularly cardio aerobic metabolism, right? Uh, your body is going to create these enzymes that make it more efficient at, um, at like performing aerobic activity, right? Long duration activity. And then in addition to that, and then those enzymes are, are running throughout your blood. Then in addition to that, your blood is going to create more hemoglobin, um, which is going to allow it to carry more oxygen molecules, right? Uh, and then in your blood vessels, they are going to get better at constricting and dilating depending on the needs 
uh, of your body at the time of that exercise. You know, um, one of the reasons like like burpees are incredible, right? Like like burpees are kind of a pain in the butt exercise because they get your your heart rate up so freaking quickly. But they are very very good for you as well because it's a total body movement. And so, and, and you're moving around so much that your body has to kind of maintain your blood pressure. And so you're actually doing little repetitions basically for your blood vessels. You're teaching them how to, how to dilate and constrict and dilate and constrict and dilate and constrict, you know, you're doing these little repetitions. So it has very positive effects on your blood pressure. So we see a direct correlation between cardiorespiratory training and an improved cardiovascular system. Meanwhile, your respiratory system, which is the pump and the passageways, right? The pump is going to get stronger uh, because you are going to get better at like, you know, you're going to develop like a stronger core. You're going to develop a, a better diaphragm. It's able to draw oxygen more in more frequently, right? Uh, you'll get less of those side stitches that you might remember getting when you were younger. Um, you know, and uh, you'll also develop like your respiratory passageways. You know, we think about like that's all the individual tubes that branch down into those little like bronchioles that are covered in those alveoli. Remember, those are blood vessels. So when we saw like improvements in our blood vessels from earlier and we saw improvements in our blood from earlier, that's going to only further uh, strengthen our respiratory passageways. So cardiorespiratory exercise, you know, going out for a run or playing, a, uh, playing some sports, a pickup game on the weekend or whatever, all that is incredible for you. Um, and it really does have like a lot of, of very big positive effects. Um, so we see our benefits here, right? Like I said, decreased risk of disease, uh, decreasing chronic illnesses, right? Aside from like diseases, right? Like we talk about like reducing your risk for diabetes. We're also going to see like a reduction in just like chronic illnesses of like maybe like osteoporosis or, you know, uh, even just like general lethargy and stuff. Um, and like I said, increased positive mood, increased self-esteem and, and a development of overall health. So uh, NASM, when you are writing an exercise, uh, a cardio program, you know, we're going to get into, when we look down here, uh, we will get into the specifics of, of stage training down here. Um, but uh, aside from that, oh, I'm going to sneeze. Just saw awesome. <laughs> Woo! Uh, <laughs> aside from that, when you're first thinking of like doing cardio, right? NASM is going to recommend that you follow uh, the FIT principles, F-I-T-T-E. Um, by the way, FIT principles are not a NASM thing. Uh, they just usually exist as F-I-T-T. <laughs> um, this is actually all personal training certifications kind of cover this, but NASM tacked the, the E on here at the end because enjoyment is actually pretty important when it comes to cardio. Um, so what the FIT principles are, are they are cardiorespiratory guidelines that are going to help you create effective safe and fun routines. So, you know, they're going to be effective. They're going to get your client to reach their goals. They're safe, so they're not going to overstress them. Uh, but they're fun and engaging, so your client will want to keep coming back and doing it more frequently, right? Um, so when we're considering the FIT principles, that's going to be our frequency, intensity, our time, type, and enjoyment factor, right? So, uh, your frequency is the number of training sessions in a given time period. This is usually in a one week period. So, you know, if we consider like if I were to just say, um, you know, let's create like a Monday, uh, like a Monday through Friday schedule here. Uh, let's see here. Come on. Uh, so seven days per week. Right. And we'll call this, uh, so this is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? Uh, so if we look at that, um, and we might <laughs> set up this routine as something like this, right? Uh, maybe Monday is like workout A, uh, Wednesday is workout B, and we go back to workout A again on Friday or something, you know? Um, pretty simple stuff. We use Tuesday, Sunday as a rest day. Well, we can do like cardio uh, on, you know, let's say if we did it on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, well, that would be, uh, that would be an example of doing it. Um, uh, this would be a, a frequency of three days per week, right? Um, but you could always like change that up a lot. I mean, your workouts could also be very cardio based, right? Like, um, 
<laughs> uh, your workouts could be very cardio based as well. Like maybe they uh, are not just strictly, um, you know, strength training sessions, right? So technically your cardio frequency could be five or six days per week, right? Um, or maybe it's, you know, maybe you involve like more rest. Maybe your client uh, rests on Wednesday and, and rests on Saturday as well. And so they're strength training on Mondays and Fridays and they got cardio on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That works really well as well. Um, that'd be a, a frequency of two days per week. So, you know, no matter how you lay it out, um, you want to make sure that you uh, are taking into account uh, the next thing that we got to look at, which is intensity. And so intensity is going to refer to the level of demand placed on the body per during that activity. So if we go back to our first scenario, right, where we were basically doing three days of cardio per week, um, if that's the case, your cardio intensity needs to be relatively low. Um, you know, if you're trying to do high intensity cardio three times a week, that might be a little bit too much for the body. Your body might not be able to keep up with something like that. So you've got to be a little cautious there, right? Um, so, uh, oops. So intensity is the level of demand. And this is usually when we're talking about the level of demand, um, we mean that it's the level of effort it's, or it's the level of uh, over, like intensity versus your maximum intensity, right? So similar to how when we're lifting and we talk about like one rep maxes. So if I can one rep max like 135 pounds uh, on like a military press or something, right? Um, if that is the most that I can do, then, you know, my intensity, if I'm lifting 100, is going to be extremely high, right? I'm at 100% intensity. But let's say I lifted at 100 pounds, right? So 100 out of 135, that's about 74% or 70 yeah, about 74% of my one rep max. So I should be able to do that for close to 12 repetitions if I take it all the way down to 100 pounds, right? So that, I know that because like we know the level of demand in comparison with maximal effort, right? Well, the same thing is true of our, our cardio, right? If I know that like uh, my maximal effort is, you know, sort of a heart rate of, let's say, you know, 185, right? Um, and I want to work at maybe 90% of that, well, then I would just take 185 times 0.9, right? And that would give me about 166 and a half, right? And that'd be pretty good. That'd be a 90% a, a of sort of my max intensity there. Um, so uh, this is usually regarded as like a percentage of your maximum, uh, your heart rate max, right? Your maximum effort heart rate max. So I'll actually kind of show you uh, let's see here. We'll go to the carbon and calculator. Remember from our assessments day, right? This is how we get uh, our, our maximum effort. This is how we determine it, right? So for me, that'd be 32. Uh, all right, and we'll hit calculate here. Um, so we can see like 95% of my heart rate max would actually be about 182. 100% of my heart rate max, I guess, would be a little bit higher than that. Um, so uh, probably 180, uh, 76 up to 82. Why am I so bad at math? That's a, so probably a closer to like 188 is my hundred is my 100% of my one rep max. Um, so we see here uh, 182 being like 95% of that, right? If I'm that's extremely high intensity. I shouldn't be doing this three days per week. That would be way too much. That's a, that's a, that's asking for an injury, right? Um, but if I'm working between 65 to 75%, you know, somewhere between 146 and 158 once per week, and then somewhere between like 158 and 170, you know, uh, the other time per week. And then I have one max intensity workout of like 170 up to 182. That would be a great cardio routine where I'm blending these three different zones together. So now, like if we go back to our first scenario here, right? And we've got cardio, this would now be cardio A, this would now be cardio B, uh, not Cardi B. Uh, <laughs> this would be cardio C. Um, so we'd say that this is like 65 to 75% heart rate max. This would be uh, uh, 76 to 85% high rate max, and this would maybe be like a max intensity workout of like 86 to 95% percent 
high rate max, right? Um, so now I've taken into account my frequency, right? Three days per week. And I've now included my intensity um, of like varying intensities, right? Uh, luckily I put my most intense workout right before my rest day. So I'll really be able to fully recover before coming back hard on Monday. Um, we'll split these up just a little bit, right? So that is our intensity there. Now you don't always have the opportunity um, to use percentage of heart rate max. Like maybe your client doesn't find it very convenient or easy to measure their heart rate as they're on the go. You know, uh, maybe they don't have like a Fitbit or a, um, an Apple Watch or anything like that, right? Uh, so maybe intensity isn't necessarily the easiest thing for them to measure if you're trying to use heart rate max as well. You don't always have to use heart rate maxes. You can also use like their perceived exertion, right? Um, and so you're, this is what we call the RPE scale. This is the rating of perceived exertion scale or the, uh, they call it the Borg scale, right? RPE scale. And it's a scale that uses like a, a range of anywhere from six to 20 to measure your intensity with six being like no effort and 20 being like, oh, I'm gonna cough up a lung. <laughs> like, you know, like this is the maximal intensity effort. So we start to see here, this is kind of what our exercise actually looks like now, right? We have like, you know, 11 being like kind of a light, pretty gentle, like sort of a warm up, right? Um, we have maybe a 13 being like somewhat hard with a 15 being pretty dang hard, a 17 being very, very hard. And then like, like I said, like 20 being like maximal exertion, right? Um, that is about as intense as it's going to get. And like I said, if you're doing this, you can't do it very often. So if we're to use like an RPE scale, right? Um, and we can see this here, uh, NASM RPE scale. Uh, let's see if I can find the picture I'm looking for here. There we go. Okay, come on. Uh, there we go. I was like, I was like freaking load. So if we see this, right? If we look at our stage training here, Rather than looking at it 65 to 75% of your heart rate max, zone one would be, you know, maybe like a 12 to 13 on the RPE scale, right? With then like an 11 being your warm up, um, you know, we get right into the kind of the middle of, you know, sort of this yellow zone here, right? And yellow in this, in this picture. Um, so, you know, that would be, uh, if we go back to our little picture here, right? That would be an RPE of, you know, 12 to 13 to 13, right? Uh, versus this version, you know, if we take a look here, zone two, that's 76 to 85%. Maybe that's an RPE of between 14 and 16, right? So that's, you know, getting closer, you know, you're starting to get onto the border of like the, the high intensity zone here, right? So that's 14 to, to 16 there. Um, so now we've got an RPE of 14 to 16. And then we've got your max intensity workout, right? Like this is your freaking hard day at the end of the week. It's like, all right, let's do it. Like this is the, the workout we, you know, we kind of work towards all freaking week. Um, that's going to be an RPE from 17 to 19. You know, we're, we're probably not going all the way up to like a full 20 because um, that's going to need lots and lots of recovery. But like 17, let's see. RPE of 17 to 19, you know, that works pretty well. Um, so you can get your client more and more and more familiar with this RPE method. You can get them more familiar with the Borg scale. The more familiar they get with it, the more you can use it and you'll start to dial it in. Like maybe you're like, hey, we're going to aim for an RPE between like 12 and 14 today. You know, it's, you're brand new. You've never worked with this client before. And they're like, okay, what is that? And then you explain to them like sort of how the RPE scale works. And they're like, okay. And so then their head, they're going to kind of go perceived effort you know what that means. And then like, as you're sort of like talking to them and kind of dialing and it's like, so did you feel like that was hard enough that like you were maybe on the border of like feeling um, sort of out of breath, but you weren't necessarily like, you like should have been able to hold a conversation the entire time, like pretty comfortably. Did that feel good? And it's like, oh no, yeah. Um, 
I was definitely getting out of breath. I had to stop a couple of times like while I was on the jog. And it's like, okay, so that that intensity is a little bit higher. That's probably, you were probably somewhere between like a 14 and a 17 or 14 and 16, right? So we can start to, the more we use the Borg scale, the better it's going to get, right? We're going to get, you know, better and better and better at it as we start to kind of dial it in. Um, really like anything else, you know, like <clears throat> I'm sure you guys probably experienced the same thing when you first started lifting weights, right? You kind of went to the gym, you're like, I don't know how much of this stuff I can pick up off the ground you know <laughs> and then you start like piling i was like nope too much right and then you pile it on you're like well that was too easy right and you kind of dial it in um same thing is true here with our cardio so that's the rpe scale uh we really like that one that's a good approach if you don't have um if you don't have access to like a heart rate monitor or a stopwatch and your client just really does not like testing their heart rate um by the way RPE scales have been getting more and more popular amongst powerlifters and bodybuilders as well. Um, so this has started making its way into the strength training world, uh, which is kind of cool. I, I like it. They, they've definitely, they're using the modified Borg scale. Uh, let's see here. If we can modify. Modified Borg scale is definitely a lot easier to visualize in your head. <laughs> um, but basically... Uh, that's with like zero, it's a zero to 10 because we're kind of used to working in base 10, <laughs> um, with like zero and like uh, up to one being like very, very light. So this is like, this is like you walking, you know, across the house, right? You're not exactly power walking, right? Uh, unless your phone's going off and you're like, I'm going to miss, it. uh, <laughs> um, then we've got like light activity. Light activity is sort of like a gentle walk. Uh, moderate activity is where maybe you're getting into a little bit, maybe like a, a fast sort of power walk. Um, but then like we start to get like a four, like that's like a little bit intense. This is where like, in my opinion, like the real cardio starts. So like this, a three on this on this version of the Borg scale is your warm up with like a four or five being zone one, a six and seven being zone two, and an eight and a nine being zone three. Um, so we really like those as this version of the scale as well. And like I said, this has been, uh, this is starting to get used a little bit more uh, in the world of like weightlifting. They're starting to use this instead of like measuring. Uh, they did a really interesting study where they, they didn't uh, measure the weights. I don't know how, um, I mean, you know what the weights are going to be when you're like picking up the bar, you know, <laughs> like, um, but I think what they did is they, rather than like programming, like a powerlifting routine, which normally powerlifting routines are very, very strict about like how much you go up by like what percentage per week and things like that. It's kind of on a set schedule, right? It's designed to kind of, if we look at it, we're looking at like powerlifting, um, we call it periodization, right? Uh, yeah, it looks something kind of like this, where basically you, you're kind of almost like the stock market, right? Like you're kind of going in like little waves here and you work your way up. Um, so you as the trainer kind of have like high intensity days and low intensity days, right? You kind of set it up um, and that would have like a positive effect. So rather than just basing it on those numbers, they based it on like an RPE situation. Um, I, for a second, I said it says pre-training and I thought that said RPE. Um so we're starting to see RPE training uh, make its way into the weightlifting world as well. Uh, but for now, when we're talking about RPE, we're pretty much always talking about cardio. Um, thirdly, there is also the talk test method. So the talk test method is going to measure your intensity uh, by maybe asking your clients questions in order to engage how well they can sort of keep up the conversation, right? So uh, the talk test method is like basically zone one, you should be able to hold a conversation pretty comfortably. Um, zone two, you should be able to hold a conversation, but like you should be a little breathy. You can kind of hear it in the voice, right? It's like, man, man, I can keep this up, but whoo. We're breathing, you know, like that version, sort of like when you're on a hike or something. Uh, and then like, you know, zone three is like, it's like, hey, let me ask you a question. I was like, nope, nope. You asked me a question, I vomit. You know, <laughs> like uh, I, I'm completely out of breath. I have no ability to talk, right? Um, and that's the talk test method. So that's another really, really popular method. So if we were to look at, you know, measuring intensity here, um, we'd say an RPE of 12 to 13 or uh, able to hold a comfortable conversation, right? 
Uh, and then here we can say an RP of 14 to 16, uh, or uh, should be able to talk, but it is a little uncomfortable. Right. Talk to you guys. Uh, and then we've got an RPE of, like I said, uh, 17 to 19, or uh, should not be able to hold a conversation. Uh oh. <laughs> my, <laughs> I don't have enough room on my freaking table here. Uh, <laughs> hold on, I can fix that. Uh, let's go with super narrow. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, uh, should be able to hold uh, a conversation pretty comfortably in zone one, uh, kind of struggles to talk in zone two, uh, and, and zone three, like, uh, not talking. <laughs> so that is, you know, those are the different methods that we can use, right? These are going, this is measuring our frequency. We see a frequency of three days per week. We see an intensity of low, medium, and high, right? Uh, any questions so far, guys? Feeling like you understand that pretty well? You're like, yeah, we got it. All right. Um, so let's take a look at time. Time is the next one, right? So, um, so time is the length of time spent in a specific given activity. Um, I was just telling my neighbor this yesterday. Uh, the CDC, they're going to recommend 150 minutes low intensity activity per week, or you can take it up to 75 minutes of high intensity activity per week. So now for thinking about it, right, if I'm in zone one, you know, and I do that for 150 minutes once per week, that is enough cardio to uh, sort of re meet the bare minimums uh, and reduce my risk for disease. Now, doing 150 minutes like straight is not exactly easy, right? That's two and a half hours of cardio straight. So that's probably pretty unrealistic. So then what if we break it up into like 30 minute sessions, right? Well, if we break it up into 30 minute sessions, we need to do that. Um, anywhere, uh, we, we would need to do uh, five sessions per week. So if I were to just go for a 30 minute walk, Monday through Friday, like if that's just how I started my day, um, that's enough to like reduce my risk for certain types of diseases, 30 minutes a day, right? Um, not that bad. And then really good news, we know that moderate to high intensity activity per week, right? That can get all the way down to 75 minutes per week. So now we're starting to talk about like zones one, you know, and, and by the way, that's like, that's, that's like low intensity activity. That's zone one, or maybe even to be honest, a little bit below zone one. You know, that's, that's pretty gentle actually. Um, so then we see like uh, the moderate to high intensity, like this is crazy high intensity, right? So we track the total number of minutes here. If we, you know, do these as sort of like a 30, if we commit to sort of 20 minutes of cardio with a five minute warm up and a five minute cool down, right? So we're like cardio workout A is 30 minutes, right? Uh, five minute warm up plus a five minute cool down. All right, if we think about that, right, um, that's really 20 minutes of just being in zone one, right? Uh, over here, that's going to be, uh, you can see here, that's 20 minutes in zone two, and that's 20 minutes in zone three. But the thing is, like, that's going to be 20, 40, 60 minutes overall, which is pretty freaking close to our 75 minutes recommended per week. Um, and uh, because it's 75 minutes of high intensity, right? Um, and we get our warm ups and our cool downs in there for an additional 10, 20, 30 minutes, right? So that's 90 minutes overall per week. We're definitely hitting the bare minimums here. And this is before we take into account that we are strength training three other days per week. So if you wanna be on the road to success, you don't necessarily need to do hours and hours and hours of cardio. And this is coming from me, guys. I love cardio. <laughs> like, I always have to like reduce the amount of cardio in my routines because I enjoy it so much. Um, you know, cardio is sort of how I, I get to be alone with my thoughts. You know, <laughs> like uh, it's my version of meditation. <laughs> 
uh, where I'm just like, Ooh, I'm frustrated. I'm going to go for a run, you know, <laughs> like, um, or like I'm tired today because I'm worn out. I'll actually go for a run. You know, it sounds crazy, but like, I feel more energized after a short little jog. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a very, that's going to have a very, very, very positive effect, but we got to be careful. We don't want to overdo it on the high intensity minutes and we don't want to underdo it on the low intensity minutes. Um, now, I will say all of these recommendations that I've been giving you are, you'll notice they are different than the PowerPoint. These are all of our general recommendations. These are the numbers you need to memorize to pass your test. Youths are a little bit different. For our, if, you are, if you ever want to go get the youth certification, the, the statistic changes a little bit. Um, we're going to recommend 75 minutes of moderate to high intensity activity. So that's going to be a little bit different, right? Like, like moderate into high intensity, or blah, what did I say? What? No. Sorry, 60 minutes of daily activity. I just literally read this right here, even though I, I highlighted this a second before. So for your youth, it's going to be 60 minutes a day. It's an hour a day, right? Uh, the NFL, you see the NFL play 60, right? Uh, this is why they, they are sort of like working with that. The play 60 is the idea that like you are trying to get activities that are going to fuel up to about 60 minutes every day with like your youth Um just trying to get them active, right? And that's really, really great. Like that's a that's a super great initiative actually, um, because that is what we are recommending. So in that case, you know, if we're doing 60 minutes a day, we know that we're definitely not aiming for high intensity there, right? Um, not that youths are very good at high intensity anyways. Remember, high intensity is gonna rely on our anaerobic training and youths don't really have a great anaerobic engine, right? They're very good at aerobic. So that's great. Like they're great at aerobic. Aerobic is low intensity. Get them active 60 minutes every single day. Uh, any questions on time, guys? I know we've been over these before. So some of you guys, you're like, yeah, we're, we know the FIT principles. <laughs> um, but hopefully, we're, you know, today we're kind of going over them in depth. Okay. So... Um, Next one, let's look at type. So type is the choice of the activity, um, you know, being performed, right? So, you know, if we look at like this version here, right? Uh, we go back to our sort of workout here. This type of stuff is like, you know, this can be performed on a treadmill. It can be performed outside going for a jog or a run or whatever, um, hitting the trails, right? Uh, I love trail, it's like trail running is the best because like it's built in interval training, you know? Um, it's na it's nature's intervals. <laughs> um, so that would be pretty good, like if you have that version. But then, you know, what if your type is cardio exercise as well? So maybe your workout A is like a total body um, circuit style routine. So if you're doing like circuit style lifting, right, um, and you're doing total body, that is, you know, going to be pretty heart rate intensive, right? That's going to really uh, amp up your heart rate a lot. Um, so chances are these are going to feel like cardio workouts, you know, workout A, B, and A again, right? Well, let's make this workout see just so I don't have to build a second week. That's going to drive me a little crazy. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, um, your workout A, your workout B, your workout C. So maybe this is something like, you know, if we were to make it uh, very simple, um, let's insert another table here. Uh, so we got workout A here. That's, yeah, I guess I did that to myself earlier. Let's go like that. <laughs> and let's go like that because it's going to be weird. Okay. All right, so here's our workout A, here's our workout B, and here's our workout C, right? We could keep this incredibly simple, right? Um, workout A could be uh, like a dumbbell, squat to shoulder press. Uh, workout B could be like a walking lunge with lateral raise. And workout C could be like a dumbbell deadlift to bent over row. So now we got a total body movement at the top of all of our, our exercises. Over here, we could do push-ups. Over here, we could do a dumbbell incline uh, chest press. Over here, we could do a dumbbell chest press, just regular. Uh, we can get the upper back going, right? We could do a uh, bent over row. 
we could do um, a two point row. And then over here we could do, actually, you know what? Let's do like a chin up, a reverse grip lap pull down. <laughs> we'll do that for instead of a chin up. Uh, and over here we'll do a wide grip lap pull down, right? Uh, and then something for the shoulders. Uh, let's go with scaption over here. Uh, we'll go with a dumbbell shoulder press. And then over here, we'll go with um, reverse fly, All right? And then we got like a squatting, let's go with a dumbbell deadlift. Uh, let's go with a step up to balance. And over here, we'll go with a goblet squat, right? Get a little core in there. Um, plank with leg raise. Let's go with a floor, single leg floor bridge. And then over here, side planks. Cool. Pretty basic routine. Uh, definitely not NASM style, right? In terms of like our overall workout, right? This is definitely not uh, doing things the way we normally do. We didn't build a full warm up or a full cool down or anything. This is just a very, very basic circuit that actually might work really well with our uh, youth clients, right? Um, I'd say like the one thing we could do, let's change this ever so slightly. We're gonna do single leg scaption. Uh, we're gonna take that, change that to a single leg. Actually, no, we got the step up to balance. That's good enough. Uh, and then, <clears throat> Oh, actually, this one, we don't really have an opportunity. Rut row. Um, all right, we'll change this up to a single leg lift and chop. So now we've got a balance exercise in there. Uh, we've got a core exercise in there, right? Um, so now this is sort of fitting a little bit better into NASM protocols, but still obviously like, you know, just sort of a general strength routine. You know, a lot of these are not necessarily stabilization exercises. But if I were to, on all of these, do uh, three sets uh, of 15 to 20 reps, and I were to do it for, uh, you know, no rest between exercises, 60 seconds rest between circuits. And there we go, right? If that was like the rule that we followed three days per week. Now, this is a really great cardio routine that a youth could perform and go through three days per week. It's gonna burn a lot of calories. It's gonna develop uh, their strength a little bit here and there. You know, it's a total body routine. Um, and so there's, this also would be a really great like weight loss routine, right? Um, so this would work pretty well uh, in terms of like getting our, our client active for 60 minutes per day, because on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they may be only doing 30 minutes of straight cardio, but they're going to do uh, flexibility training. They're going to do maybe a little bit of core and balance stuff, uh, sort of warming up, maybe do some reactive stuff in there, right? Uh, meanwhile, they've got these versions here to really develop the strength as well. So that is your type, right? This type of training, circuit training, is a very engaging type, right? Um, it works pretty well. And over here, this type could be saying, okay, well, we're going to do the treadmill, right? Now, obviously, if you're training an adult, they've got sort of the gumption to work towards their goals. They're going to maybe stick to the treadmill if you tell them to, right? Um but with youths, uh, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> so instead, uh, you're probably going to do other unique activities, things like circuits, uh, like I just built in the other version. Games are really fun, right? Playing specific fitness games. Um, tag is a blast. Um, or sp specific like sport type drills where we start getting into like reactive and SAQ training and stuff, right? Um, so that would be a little bit more engaging for our youth. So we've kind of got an adult version here. Like this is a general sort of adults routine, um, but I could very, very, very easily uh, change this to like a youth style. Um, I would keep total body circuit on, so I would just leave that alone. Um, this works sort of with adults or kids. 
Um, but then like for these cardio days, I wouldn't say like 30 minutes, you know, with a five minute warm up or cool down. I'd be, be a little bit more specific about it. And I would say uh, playing tag, um, you know, over here, I'd say something like playing capture the flag. And then over here, maybe it's like on Saturday, which is the high intensity day. Maybe that's where we like, you know, practice SAQ and athletic drills, right? So um, yeah, it's probably hyphenated. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, that is sort of what that would look like in like a youth version. But you know, and actually, I'll just leave that up here. Um, so there's our type, right? Um, and type is going to have a really big implication for our last thing that we're looking at in the FIT principles, uh, which is the enjoyment factor. A little bit, I mean, honestly, enjoyment is important for literally every client you're training. Uh, but this is the level of pleasure derived from the specific activity that you are engaging in, right? Your activities with your youth, they should be fun. They should be engaging. They should enhance your client's adherence, right? It should be something that your client looks forward to doing every single time, right? They should be stoked, right? Um, do not pick boring, repetitive stuff. This is why everyone hates treadmills. <laughs> um, although, like, you know, Places like Orange Theory have found a way to make uh, the parts of like treadmill training that the people don't like. Um, they've sort of incorporated it in ways that they do like, right? Like they're varying their intensities. They got, you know, fun instructors. Um, they've built sort of a lifestyle around it to make it fun and engaging, right? Orange Theory has made an entire business model on doing nothing fancy when it comes to cardio. Like they'll market it as such. Like, let's see here, Orange Theory. Um, like they're totally marketing it as like, you know, we're giving you this intense scientific word, the smartest workout for more results. Look at that. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <Winter>. Uh, <laughs> and so like, uh, you know, they're breaking it down into these five specific zones. They're telling you about how great rowing is and cardio in particular strain, how it's going to develop strength training as well. None of this is fancy. Like none of this is new. <laughs> like we've known about all of this forever. I used to do, I used to literally teach exactly Orange Theory style classes, um, literally exactly those classes uh, when I worked at BLR. You know, that's a, most of like what my job was, was leading uh, people through these cardio classes where I'd have a microphone on. I'd be walking around the room and everybody would be on some people be on treadmill, some people be on elliptical, some people be on the, there was like one rower. Um, and my job was just to bounce around and yell at people and be like, come on, you got this, you're doing great. We're gonna raise our intensity. All right, everybody relax, bring it back, bring it back. It was a spin class, you know, it was totally a spin class. Um, spin classes where you just got that one person in the front of the room leading everybody like, bring it up, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down, work hard, relax, right? Up and down and up and down and up and down, um, but it's, fun you got goofy you know i used to play goofy music i used to you know uh, i used to do this thing we had a jacob's ladder um does anybody know what a jacob's ladder is actually i guess i should show you that jacob's ladder these are these are fairly uh uncommon but oh good it got it's four thousand dollars so um is that gronks all right let's click that one uh <laughs> yep so uh, basically what happens is you, and what's funny, okay, so here's the thing. This girl is not on this machine right now. Uh, unless it's set to like a specific, like unless this version has like the ability to set the time. But normally what you do is you wear this belt. Um, you can see he's wearing the belt there. And uh, that belt is tied into the bottom of the machine. So the farther you climb upwards, the more it pulls the, you know, the cord that's attached to the belt. So then the speed the machine speeds up. It actually gets faster. So if you get closer to the top, the ladder will start moving more quickly. And if you get closer to the bottom, the ladder will actually slow down a little bit. So we used to have one of these at, at BLR and I would, um, 
we kept it right, right right by the front where everyone was like watching and i would like i would go like around the room and i'd be like all right who's doing their next interval right during like a recovery or something and people are like oh, and they're all like resting and recovering i'd be like all right who's gonna be the next person on the jacob's ladder who wants to do the next interval on jacob's ladder and people are like oh no, no no like that's way too intimidating it's too intense you know because when you come off it people are drenched um and I'd like get volunteers and I'd be like, all right. And I'd, I'd make a wager with people. I'd be like, if you do this many minutes on Jacob's letter, I will do this many burpees, you know? And people loved it. Like people, it was a fun like thing to, to keep them engaged, right? I was focusing all my efforts into keeping their enjoyment levels high because like these people were working out three, four hours a day, five days a week. That's high intent, you know? It's actually pretty low intensity because otherwise their bodies would break. But uh, you know, it was it was a lot of exercise. So like the enjoyment factor can be really really low. So we want to make sure that we try to keep that enjoyment factor as high as possible, right? Make sure it's fun. Make sure it's engaging. Um, for youths, this is extremely important, right? Um, this is important for everybody, but it's it's really important for our youths, right? It's one of the most important factors. Um, always make sure they're fun and challenging. So, you know, hopefully something like this, right, where we said, you know, the type is that we're focusing primarily on like playing cardiovascular games that involve like a lot of running paired with like a fun circuit style strength training, right? This would keep it would keep the uh, enjoyment factor high. And I could probably make the enjoyment factor even higher by doing something as simple as being like, we're not going to call it a dumbbell shoulder. We're not going to call it a dumbbell squat to shoulder press. We're going to call it, I don't know, something else. <laughs> so I come up with a goofy name for it, right? Uh, we'll call it power thrusts. <laughs> you know, something fun. And, you know, if you literally rename exercises sometimes, that is enough to make it fun for your clients. Um, that weird variety. And they'll be like, this is just a walking lunge. It's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? This is very clearly, you know, blah, 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 whatever name you want to make up. Um, I used to have like all these goofy names for, for certain exercises, and I can't remember any of them right now. But um, so all of those are going to be really great techniques. And those are some ways that you can sort of implement those things. Um, so circuit training, right? We love circuit training. Uh, this is picking predetermined exercises and arranging them in like a sequence with little to no rest in between. It's really great for developing strength, but it's also really great for developing your cardiorespiratory system. Uh, and it works really, really well in a small group setting as well, which is great, right? We love the fact that it works, um, you know, I used to love, uh, basically, if I knew that I wanted to do like a circuit like this, I could set up like, uh, you know, a version of this around the room. In fact, actually, do I have, hold on just a second. I'm going to go to my Google Drive. Uh, let's see if I can even find one of my old circuit workouts. Um, BLR. Old classes from BLR. Holy crap. So here's some of my old Biggest Loser workouts. Uh, I think, yeah, there's my, okay. All right. Um, so, uh, I haven't opened this in a while. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really remember what's on here. Um, come on. So this is a total toning class. This is meant to be like a version that would be like repeatable at home. This is something I used to print out for the guests if they wanted it. Uh, so this isn't a hundred percent what I would do every time or anything. Um, yeah, so I would set up these little tiny, uh, little mini circuits, right? And so it'd be like, you're going to do some squats, then you're going to do some dumbbell curls, and then we're going to do some self-propelled cardio. So in a group exercise room, um, if I were doing that, what I would do is I would set up like spin bikes. Um, so I'd put like a spin bike like here, uh, here, and like here. Yeah, I just drag them out into the middle of the room. Uh, and just arrange these like this. And I would pair people up with people who are like somewhat similarly, uh, similar, similar height, right? Uh, and then I would put like a mat next to each of these. I just realized this is going to be way easier if I do it this way. Uh, and then I would put like a pair of dumbbells. What looks like a dumbbell? Uh, with the hard thing. Because <laughs> we love dumbbells. Um, so I'd set it up like this, right? I'd set up the whole room. Um, 
and I would just have all these sort of identical stations uh, built around the room, right? Because we'd have like um, about 30 guests in each class, right? So I'd need about 10 of these. I'd probably put, you know, put one over here, put another one over here. Um, yeah. So I'd set up like 10 stations like this, right? And so you would have like person A uh, on this first one, right? Um, so that'd be like A, and then this would be B, and then this would be C. So this would be, you know, uh, the mat is where you would do, let's see, what do I got in this, this routine that we just built? Uh, maybe the mat is where you do your, bar, your body weight squats. And then the other person's doing dumbbell curls here. And then the other person would get on a spin bike and go for like the same like duration of time. And I would just have those three people like switch, we would do three sets and then the whole room would rotate. So this group of three would move over here. This group of three would move over here, right? And they would just work their way around the room. And then this would be the next circuit, right? This would be, what do I got on here? Uh, a deadlift into a shoulder press into, and this is self-propelled cardio, but we say like a, maybe a spin bike or something. So it was a, you know, cardiovascular strength training sort of hybrid workout, right? I don't know. Does that make sense to everybody, the way I'm describing this? Um, everybody understand how this class would work? Yep. Okay. <laughs> like, hopefully be able to visualize that. Um, it's a great way to run your boot camps, um, doing this sort of like small, I used to call it like pod versions of things, right? We, we just set up all these like little pods and they would work their way around the room. Um so uh, love circuit training. Circuit training is super, super fun. Um, kids love group training too. So small group training or large group training, group exercise classes, all that's gonna be really, really, really great. So um, we love circuit training, little to no rest in between. Uh, it's very efficient. You can get a lot of work done uh, in very limited space. It adds cardiorespiratory, a cardiorespiratory element to your training because you don't get to rest after you're done. It's like, oh, coof, man, I got a little bit out of breath doing that one and I got to do the next one, right? Like you just kind of keep your heart rate elevated. Um, and like I said, it can be very beneficial for group settings. Um, so there's a lot of different variations out there um, for circuit training. Uh, you know, we would do sort of, you could do body weight circuits, right? Body weight circuits are super fun. They're very simple. They can be performed literally anywhere because you don't need any equipment at all. Um, so if you were to set up a, a little like lunges into prisoner squats, into push-ups, into jumping jacks, into mountain climbers, repeat, right? Great body weight exercise, right? Love that. Um, simple, engaging. It could be fun as long as you are keeping the energy really high. Um, it's a great routine. Someone's using my shower. Uh, <laughs> so that is um, that is sort of our classic body weight circuit. Then we have like a sports performance circuit. It's a little bit different, right? Uh, this is going to be stuff that challenges your speed, your agility, your quickness. Uh, gets a little reactive training in there. Uses a, you know, develops a little bit of coordination, right? Generally. This requires a little bit of equipment, but like nothing fancy, right? This is actually what we're going to do uh, in the park in a week, right? On, on Tuesday when we get together. Um, we're going to set up speed ladders. We're going to run through the speed ladders. We're going to run from cone to cone to cone to cone to cone to cone to cone. Um, you know, little tiny things that really don't take that much. I'm going to hopefully uh, bring out my battle rope, um, which Charlie's still in the car, right? You're the freaking master of. Last time I saw you do that, you were a, a freaking battle robe phenom. Uh, <laughs> so these are our fun little, uh, you know, that's a fun little variation, right? Um, so doing something like squat jumps into a speed ladder where you do like one ends, right? That's just one step in every uh, part of the ladder. Going into like a side shuffle from maybe cone to cone, back to the speed ladder, doing like a hopscotch drill, followed by like running through like a snake drill. That would be super, super fun, right? Um, then we've got functional movement circuits, which are really just a fancy way of saying all the fun trainery versions of things. <laughs> um, but these are all the kind of weird exercises that don't really fit in any of the specific levels. It's like, is that stabilization? It's like, yeah, a little. Is it strength? It's like, yeah, a little. <laughs> is that power? 
Yeah, a little. Yeah, you know, like uh, functional movement circuits are all the kind of weird, funky stuff that kind of falls between ROPT levels, right? Now, a sagittal step up curl to overhead press, and then he's doing a step up to balance curl to overhead press. That's very much like just a total body movement. This would be totally a stabilization exercise. But then over here, he's doing like uh, side, like hand walkovers, right? So he's going to bring himself up onto the box. Keep you over here. Bring himself up onto the box and then go down to the other side, right? And he's going to go kind of back and forth like this, right? I don't know. What is that? Is that stabilization? I mean, he's kind of keeping his core stable the whole time. It's a very unstable movement, you know? Um, maybe I'd put it in there, but it's also like kind of explosive because he's moving side to side pretty rapidly. Um, so it's a functional movement, right? It's just a, it's kind of a fun one that we can kind of throw there. Squat to tubing row, push-ups with a rotation. It's all, like I said, all the fun kind of complicated stuff that, you know, the complicated is actually some of the funnest stuff, you know? Sometimes like someone's like, holy crap, that looks weird, right? Uh, look at like an around the world. Uh, you ever look at this, uh, is this the right one? I don't think it would be around the world. Oh, this is not actually. Nope. No, 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 no. Uh, around the world burpee. <laughs> Let's see here. It says a burpee. What? No, 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 no. Ugh, people. Uh, I mean, she's doing, she's going to go in four sequences there. Anyway, it's a really fun exercise where like you do like a burpee into like a renegade row into a squat curl to press uh, into like a lunge with a ladder. It's like a whole big complicated thing. Set the dumbbells down, do a pull up, right? Like, And it's all these exercises built into like technically what is one exercise. But it's like that classic example. You remember that Euro training video I showed you? Like the dude from uh, uh, Terry Crews when he was on uh, My Wife and Kids. And he's like, and he's like, ah, ah, ah. he's like doing all these different pieces to like a dumbbell car. And he goes, that's one. <laughs> that's an around the world. And so those are, they're kind of fun. They're, I, I consider that like a weird functional movement. It's like, where do you put that in the OPT model, you know? Um, so stay creative, have lots of fun, keep your clients' interests in mind. Uh, but don't always, don't forget, Whenever you're writing a cardio routine, you always want to make sure that it is based on your client's goals uh, and that you are working towards whatever it is that they are trying to work towards. So that is sort of all of our general approach to cardio training. Do you guys have any questions on that? All righty. So uh, last thing I want to do, I want to go through how to write this in terms of the OPT template. So. Let's take a look at, we look at the OPT model. If we have this here, uh, yeah, in fact, no, let's get a better version. Oh, come on, I saw it yesterday. I literally just had it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so here's our, our uh, OPT model here, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's let's expand this out just a little. Oh wait, no, no, no. no. <laughs> so um, this is like I said, it's going to consist of our. You guys know this three levels, right? Uh, five phases within those levels. Um, so if our client is in these, these levels actually correspond pretty well with NASM's approach to cardio training, which is actually stage training. So NASM is going to use a stage training approach, um, you know, uh, when it comes to developing your cardio. So this can correspond with the OPT model, but it doesn't necessarily always have to. Um, this can also kind of be its own thing. Um, So uh, if we look at this, if we look at like the cardio side of things, right, we're going to see this is going to fall under what we call stage one. And you're going to see that I always write stage one with a Roman numeral. So clients in the stabilization phase, 
no matter how good my client's heart is, uh, like how good a shape my client's heart is in, you know, um, they're still going to get something out of stage one training. So I, I honestly like to start pretty much every client I get um, in stage one, at least in the beginning, right? To develop like a foundation for the types of things that we're going to be doing. Most clients are going to probably need this for quite some time, actually. They need to build up their foundation for a while. But what stage one is going to be is you know, basically implementing zone one, uh, and that's about it. So this is going to involve zone one, which we kind of talked about earlier, right? That's uh, going to be sorry, uh, zone one, right? And that's sort of written with our, our classic sort of Arabic numerals. Um, and zone one is going to be anywhere from 65 to 75 percent heart rate max, right? Um, or like I said, it could be uh, that R that RPE scale, right? You could totally use the RPE scale of, of like a 12 to a 13, right? Um, I could use the talk test and say like, all right, so what you want your client to do if they're in the stabilization level, it's like, look, we're going to do three days per week where you're just going to do stage one cardio, right? Um, pretty gentle. Uh, now, if your client is in phase two, three, or four, they're going to get a stage two routine, right? So stage two is going to implement zones one and two. You're going to use both these things, right? So stage two might look something like this, right? You'd say um, stage two, and that's going to consist of zone two, which is 76 to 85% heart rate max, uh, and and zone one for recovery, which is that classic, you know, like I said, 65 to 75% RA max. Um, so this is implementing both of those instead. Uh, and that's sort of our introduction to interval training, right? This is where we start getting in to using intervals as like a method, right? Um, and that's great, like intervals are incredible. Uh, so we'll, we'll sort of show you what that looks like here in just a second. And then if we had a client who's in level three, right? So phase five, um, we'd give them a stage three routine. And so stage three might look something like this, right? So we go stage three, right? And stage three is gonna consist of zone three, which is that 86 to 95% heart rate max, right? Uh, or, and zone two, so that's 76 to 85 percent heart rate max and then it'll consist of zone one which is that 65 to 75 percent heart rate max um and there we go there's our basic uh, set up for, for, you know, what zones are most appropriate for our clients, depending on what level they're in. Now, if you get a client who progresses to hypertrophy, um, like, let's say you're training somebody for 30 straight days, right? Like they, they, they sign up, they're a new year's resolution client. They're like, I've never exercised before. Right. And you put them in on a stabilization routine for their first month, because, you know, you need to develop all those good, healthy habits and stuff. Um, and you reassess them on the 31st of January, right? That's the end of the month. And you're like, hey, well, let's do a reassessment. We, we assessed you on January 1st. Um, let's assess you now again, like 30 days later, see what improvements have been made. We see that their weight has gone down a little bit. Their body fat percentage has dropped a little bit. Uh, we see they've gained a little bit of muscle. All of their one rep maxes went up. Their overhead squat looks a little bit different, which is great, right? Uh, and we put them on the YMCA step test. And, you know, the first time their heart rate recovered to, let's say, I, I got to make up a fake number here. Uh, let's say it recovered to like 130 the first time you ever did it, right? Which would be not super awesome. Um, so they recovered to like 130. So that's why they got a poor score. So we put them in stage one cardio. And then on the 31st, you test them again. And their heart rate recovered down to 125. It's not a huge difference. They're definitely improving, but it's not enough to get them to qualify for a stage two routine. When you move them into strength endurance next month, right, February 1st, right, you're going to start your strength endurance routine. You're probably still only going to do stage one cardio. So these don't 
always have to match up. These stages and levels don't always have to match up. Sometimes they're not perfect, right? Um, but in general, if you've got a client who's in really, really great shape, you can run a routine just like this. So if we go back to the routine that we were building earlier, this is a client who is capable of doing, you know, zone one, zone two, and zone three. So this is a stage three routine, right? Um, and that could work really, really well, or, you know, maybe it's a little bit too much stress. If that's the case, then honestly, we could just copy this and, uh, and alternate between like, uh, you know, cardio A and cardio B, and there is no cardio C, it's just cardio A again, right? So we've got to go back to this. Um, so they would go back uh, exactly like that, right? So now it's like A, B, A, and then next we could be B, A, B, right? Um, or maybe it's just A, 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 you know? It's just the same cardio workout for a little while. All of those are good versions, right? Every one of those routines, it's gonna be dependent on how well your client performs in their cardiorespiratory assessments, right? But basically what we're looking for, right? Um, I put a little asterisk here. Clients in advanced stage of training will still want to incorporate low intensity days, right? So a client in stage three would have a stage one day, they'd have a stage two day, and they'd have a stage three day. Um, and that's what their sort of interval training would look like. Um, and yeah, that is pretty much your tutorial. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Kenny, you got any questions? Cody, Dalen, Charlie? Oh, Charlie's gone. We lost Charlie. <laughs> nope. You guys feel like if I made you write cardio routines, you feel like you could put them together? Yeah. Love that. All right. Um, by the way, we're, I, you know, in all these example versions, I'm writing like percentages. Um, let's go back to that carbon and calculator that we, we punched in our information from earlier, right? Um, uh, let's say our client's 35, resting heart rate of uh, 79 beats per minute, right? Um, we would actually tell our clients not, I want you to be between 65 and 75%. We'd say, I want your heart rate to be anywhere from 148 to 159, right? Um, and then we would set them up with like an interval routine. Let's say they have like a stage three day, right? That's 95 to 85, like some point they're doing 86 to 95, right? Um, If we look at those stage training days, come on, internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. I'm really trying to get one where they have these all laid out next to each other. All right, I'll just pull up three different ones. So that's that one. There's that one. And give me an intense one. There we go. Okay, so they might look something like this, right? Here's a zone one workout where this is what their heart rate would look like, right? Five to 10 minutes, probably around 50% of their heart rate max, nothing crazy, right? And then 30 to 60 minutes, somewhere between 65 and 75%, and then they would just cool down, right? They really never left, um, they never left uh, zone one. Clients who are doing their, you know, sort of introducing interval training, uh, I know this is really pixelated, but um, we'd warm them up, then put them into like zone two. So we would tell our client, be like, you know, they're going to do one minute in zone two and three minutes back in zone one. So like if it were this client here, I'd say, all right, I want your heart rate to be anywhere between 159 and 169 for one minute. Then you're going to recover anywhere from 148 to uh, 159 for three minutes. So I'd probably honestly just pick the numbers right in between. I'd say, I want you to be around 164 for a minute, and I want you to be around 153 for three minutes. And those are the two numbers that you're going to try to be really close to in terms of your intensity. And they're just going to do that with their interval training, right? And the exact same thing is true here, right? They're going to do maybe one minute uh, at sort of, I'd say that's probably like 80%, another minute at 85%, a minute at 90%, back to 85, 
back to 90, right? And then maybe they would just cool down. Um, not exactly the world's longest routine, but definitely very intense, right? Um, so that is uh, what we are going to see there. Um, what the, get out of here, get out of here, all of you. Um, that is what we're going to see in terms of setting up like a, a full on like periodized uh, cardiovascular routine. And that is what I got for you today, guys. Um, everybody feeling pretty good? Anybody have any questions? All right, guys. So today, uh, today was day five, right? So we got homework tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, we sat homework yesterday. So you guys are all clear to go. I'm going to let everybody out of here, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow.